Lie groups are special because they have a weird property they require by definition. They have to be manifolds and topological groups. How is that supposed to work? Say we have an object moving in a 2D Cartesian plane. Theta is an angle describing the object's orientation in the plane, usually relative to the positive x-axis. It indicates the direction the object is facing. When the object moves with constant velocities vx in the x-direction and vy in the y-direction, its position changes linearly over time. When the object rotates around its current position, this rotation does not affect its x and y coordinates, but changes its orientation, theta. The change in orientation over time due to rotation at a constant angular velocity omega is described by this equation. When the object combines translation or moving forward and rotation or turning, its path becomes a curve rather than a line. Likewise, if you first move the object forward and then rotate it, it ends up in a different position than if you rotate it first and then move it forward. All of these are known as poses. Now, there are actually more specifics to how the object behaves. Like, say we want to define the composition of poses T1 and T2. This is pretty complicated. So, to make calculations more manageable, poses are often represented using matrices. The matrix form you're looking at is a compact way to represent both rotation and translation in 2D space. It simplifies the process of combining these transformations through matrix multiplication. R is a matrix within a matrix. Cosine of theta determines how much of the original x coordinate is preserved. Minus sine of theta determines how the original y coordinate transforms and contributes negatively to the new x coordinate. Sine of theta determines how the original x coordinate transforms and contributes positively to the new y coordinate. Cosine of theta determines how much of the original y coordinate is preserved. The t is a translation vector, a column vector. It moves the object from one point to another by adding x and y to the existing coordinates. The ones and zeros basically preserve properties so that the matrix can be translated back to the original equation. When the matrices are multiplied, the result shows the combined effect of the two rotations and the translational composition. So far, we've pretty much described the same graph we've had previously, but more accurately, I might say. Now, here's something else to add. The line is actually a combination of a bunch of tiny motions t of delta, infinitesimally small motions of the object, to be exact, like a bunch of tiny rotations and translations. That's described using this matrix. Omega delta, Vx delta, and Vy delta represent small changes in angle and position. For very small delta, the cosine and sine of omega delta can be approximated to this. Thus, this leads us to a simplified version of T of delta. For clarity, let's break down what this means. I is the identity matrix. You see this squiggle right here? That's Xi the 2D twist vector, or the incremental transformation matrix. This concept is super, super important. But first, let's see what it's composed of. This matrix combines angular velocity, omega, dictating how fast and in what direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, the object rotates, and linear velocities, vx, vy, dictating how the object moves along the x and y axes. The matrix C represents the infinitesimal transformations an object can undergo. In other words, C encodes the smallest possible movements, both rotational and translational, that the object can experience. When you add delta into the mix, you are scaling these infinitesimal transformations to still very small but finite changes. The product delta C, when added to the identity matrix I, forms a matrix that approximates the actual transformation matrix for these small but finite transformations. When it comes to the real world, t or time can be quite large. So in order to manage it, when that's the case, t needs to be split up into smaller time intervals. Let's say n of them, each of length t over n. This approach allows for modeling the motion more accurately. And it does it by capturing how the pose changes at each small step. Thus, we have this capital T of t, approximates to i plus t over n xi, all of it to the power of n. The term effectively says, apply a small transformation based on the velocities in xi, scaled down to the small time interval t over n. 
The power n in this equation indicates that this small transformation is applied repeatedly, n times, to cover the entire duration t. The most perfect solution possible is given when n is taken to infinity, since that's the most continuous and smooth transformation. In the context of transformations, Xi on its own just describes an infinitesimal transformation. So tiny, it's essentially theoretical. But when we multiply C by t, we are scaling it to span an entire time period t. Now, if we apply C t just once, it wouldn't capture the continuous nature of transformation. It would just be a single finite transformation at one moment. What we want to model here is a transformation that continuously happen over a time interval t. And this is where the exponential function becomes crucial. By expressing the transformation as e to the power of xi t, we're saying apply xi from time 0 to time t. Essentially, if you want to understand exponential growth through the mathematical lens, you break it down into infinitely many small steps, such that they compound over time. For real numbers, this expresses this. The process of taking a twist matrix xi and converting it into a complete transformation matrix e to the power of xi t is a mapping from the algebra of twists or the infinitesimal generators of motion to the group of rigid transformations or the actual motions in space. When we refer to the process of mapping 2D twist matrices xi to 2D rigid transformations using the matrix exponential e to the power of xi t, we're talking about what's known in mathematics and physics as the exponential map. If you guys are enjoying this video, please do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. It really helps us. Also, leave us some suggestions in the comment section below so that we can know what kind of videos you guys want. Rigid transformations are those that don't change the shape or size of an object. They only adjust its position or orientation. This means they include all the ways you can rotate and translate an object within a plane without distorting them. We call the space of 2D rigid transformations, along with the composition operation, the special Euclidean group SE2. SE2 is a Lie group for three reasons. First, because it is a group. It satisfies all of four properties that a group must have. Second, because it is a topological group. In fact, all Lie groups are topological groups by definition. In a topological group, the two main group operations, composition, combining two transformations, and inversion, finding the reverse of transformation, must be continuous functions. This means that if you slightly change the parameters of a transformation, like a small change in the rotation angle theta or the translation x and y, the results of these operations, whether it's combining transformations or inverting them, also changes smoothly and continuously. And third, SE2 is a manifold. By definition, all Lie groups are manifolds. The key idea is that even if a manifold might have twists or curves on a large scale, if you zoom in close enough at any point, it behaves like a flat space, allowing you to apply tools like calculus. Obviously, there is a much more complete explanation for it, but that's the gist of it. SE2 represents all possible rigid transformations or combination of rotations and translations in a 2D space. Each transformation involves a rotation by an angle theta and translation by two amounts, one along the x-axis and one along the y-axis. These three parameters form a set of local coordinates for SE2, and they vary continuously. Locally, this space behaves just like regular 3D Euclidean space, R3. But globally, it has a more interesting structure, because rotations are circular, meaning that the rotation parameter theta wraps around every 2 pi radians or one full revolution. This makes the rotation part behave like a circle, which is mathematically denoted as S1, rather than a straight line, and translations X and Y that extend infinitely in both directions, just like R2. This means globally, SE2 is equivalent to the product manifold S1 times R2. Locally, however, it looks like R3. Plus, SE2 is not just a manifold, but a smooth manifold. In practical terms, if you slightly change theta, x or y, the transformation changes smoothly without any jumps or discontinuities. So now that we set everything up, let's see an example of a transformation in SE2, which is the group of 2D rigid transformations, rotations and translations, as a reminder. The transformation can be represented as a 3x3 three three matrix, where the top left block represents the rotation, the top right block represents the translation, 
The bottom row makes this matrix fit within the framework of homogeneous coordinates for rigid transformations. Let's consider this simple transformation. Rotate an object by 90 degrees counterclockwise, so theta is pi over 2. Translate the object 2 units along the x-axis and 3 units along the y-axis. This transformation can be written in a matrix form. Let's substitute the trigonometric values for pi over 2, so the matrix becomes this. What does this transformation do? The block in the top left represents a rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise. If you apply it to any point in the plane, it will rotate the point around the origin. The column vector 2, 3 represents a translation of 2 units in the x direction and 3 units in the y direction. Let's say you have a point P equals 1, 1 in a 2D space. To apply the SE2 transformation to this point, you can extend the point to homogeneous coordinates by writing P as 1, 1, 1. The third coordinate is 1 for homogeneous coordinates. Now multiply the transformation matrix T by the point P. After applying the transformation, the point P, which was 1, 1, is moved to the new position 1, 4. This is a simple example of an element of SE2 that combines both a rotation and a translation. This video was inspired by this work and this book. Check out the link in the description. Don't forget to check out the PDF link in the description below, which has a summary of the entire video. It's only by actually doing math and practicing it that you get good at it. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you there.